Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? I'm Hannah from Intelligence Squared, and we are hugely honored to have worked together with Sotheby's on this very special event, which is part of Sotheby's Jubilee Arts Festival. As I think you'll have seen if you've been wandering around, there is an amazing array of exhibitions of royal portraits, um, historical books and manuscripts, um, aristocratic jewels. There are some amazing tiaras downstairs, so do go um, afterwards if you haven't seen already and um, feast on what's on offer. This event, the Great Battle of the Queens, uh, links to the exhibition of royal portraits downstairs, and there's a beautiful portrait of Queen Elizabeth I and also of Queen Victoria. But now it's time to get going, and I'm delighted to hand over to our chair. He is a distinguished historian, amongst many other things, and to my mind, very much the best of British. Please welcome <laughs> Sir Anthony Selden. Thank you, Hannah, very much. And uh, on Thursday night, I was in the Guild Hall in Windsor, as one is, and there were the portraits of the various monarchs up around uh, the wall, and there looking at me uh, over dinner uh, was Elizabeth I, and then just over there, there was Elizabeth II, and behind me, there was Victoria, and there were also a lot of men, monarchs. And you felt the difference in the 500 years between the sensational and long-lasting women and the dreary specimens, <laughs> rather like on the panel here uh, before you, <laughs> of, of, of malehoodness. Charles I, Charles II, James II, George II, William IV, George IV. Edward the Seventh, uh, and you just think, don't you? Uh, what is it about female monarchs? <laughs> what is it about women in general that gives them so much more charisma and power? And that's what we're going to be teasing out at this most beautifully timed event uh, now, and uh, organised by and um, care of Sotheby's. This is where I switched to my notes. Uh, slight uh, 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 ripples there. Sotheby's. Platinum Jubilee Arts Festival, magnificent for the debate on Queen Elizabeth I versus Queen Victoria. So just, I'm sure that many of you have been to the debates, uh, and if not, why not? <laughs> I'm going to ask you to vote first, and if you haven't already done so, please, uh, can you hold your phones? and scan the QR code, and you'll see uh, on the screen behind me and on the screens. And you, can you vote on whether, you've got three choices here, Elizabeth I, or Queen Victoria, or don't know, I mean, quite like in these debates, don't knows, because it implies that there is work to be done uh, by the panel here. So don't be intimidated. Um, to, uh, to, to, to say that you don't know on this really important question, the results of which are going to be flashed first through to Buckingham Palace because <laughs> Her Maj is waiting uh, there uh, and actually watching uh, live um, your, 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 your Majesty uh, for the results here before the Platinum Jubilee can properly uh, and fully take <laughs> off. So, while you are voting and deciding which of these three you're going to be going for, I'm just going to ask here, Queen Victoria, when you first fell in love with Queen Victoria. Me? Uh, the person representing Queen Victoria. That would be, that yes. would be me. That, first, that, that, that would be That you. would be me. Um, yes, I first fell in love with Queen Victoria when I was <laughs> that gave 18. That you a job, didn't it? 18, I was sitting in the <laughs> university library and um, I, I was uh, doing, I was studying history at Cambridge and one of the things I was doing was Queen Victoria and the monarchy and I was assigned her diaries to read. And I was thinking, oh, God, there was this great big pile of diaries. I was thinking, oh, no, God, this is really going to be tough. Because I had this image of Queen Victoria being this sort of boot-faced woman in a bonnet who never smiled. Anyway, 
I, I picked it up, I opened it at volume, and I found it was sort of 1839. And um, I looked at it, and I thought, oh, I started to read. And she was 19, the same age as I am now. And I realized that, you know, instead of this boot-faced old woman, she, at the time, was this incredibly passionate, sexual teenager who'd fallen in love for the first time. And um, as Kate's here, I'm just going to ask her to read this a tiny little quote. Friday, November the 1st, 1839. A horrid day, cold, dreadfully blowing, and in addition, raining hard when we had been out a few minutes. I was obliged to put on my cape. The rifles looked beautiful. It was piercingly cold, and I sat in my cape, which dearest Albert settled comfortably for me. He was so cold, dear angel, being in full dress uniform with tight white cashmere pantaloons. <laughs> Nothing under them. <laughs> <laughs> and high boots. We cantered home again. Well, there you go. Uh, and, and there we go. I'm just going to ask Kate here, uh, when did you first fall in love? Oh, I remember very well. I fell in love with Elizabeth I when I was eight years old, as a lot of little girls did of my generation and my mother's generation, because I had my mother's ladybird book of Elizabeth I. <laughs> and it showed her as this incredibly powerful woman, yet surrounded by men. She's constantly, all these pictures of her telling men what to do. And I thought, well, that looks great. And then years <laughs> later, I, I, I'd sort of always adored her, so I thought, well, I'll do my PhD on her. And I discovered that almost everything I'd read in the Lady Bird book was wrong, of course, <laughs> and was part of these sort of great national myths. But I fell in love with her all over again in different ways. And actually, I fell in love with her words. She is a great writer. And one of the things that made me say yes to this particular debate, this gig, is I'm so excited that both of us are going to be presenting these queens to you through their words. Elizabeth was proficient in six languages. She was a great wordsmith. Words were a big part of how she stamped her authority on the world around her. Thank you. And you're all going to be flabbergasted by the result. Um, the panelists will hear this concurrently with you. Elizabeth I, 53% of you voted for Elizabeth I. Victoria, 18%. Shame. <laughs> and undecided, 29%. So there is work to be done. And uh, Linton Crosby uh, standard here is going to need to get some barnacles off the boat to swing this round <laughs> in favour of uh, tipping this uh, over. Just a word about Kate Mortby on my right, academic journalist, theatre critic, um, broadcast regularly, as you know, and as she said, um, is a uh, really leading intellectual on Elizabeth. Daisy on my left, uh, screenwriter, novelist, uh, created Victoria on ITV, uh, published Victoria, a novel of a young queen, and responsible for grand designs on Channel 4. And they've got two wonderful actresses to support them. Uh, Greta Skaki is going to play Elizabeth I. Uh, you'll know Greta from many things, including Heat and Dust, White Mischief, and Presumed Innocent. Uh, you will have seen her, I certainly did, because she gave me free tickets, uh, on the West End uh, for The Entertainer, The Deep Blue Sea, and Uncle Vanya. And she played Elizabeth uh, first in Schiller's Mary Stewart. Uh, and Kate O'Flynn here, an actor and producer, appeared amongst other places, the National Theatre productions of Port, A Taste of Honey, and in films including Mike Lee's Happy Go Lucky, Up There, and Mr. Turner. And she's currently filming a recurring role in Everybody Else Burns for Channel 4. <laughs> sorry, so, so, sorry, sorry. Uh, that, that is meant to read... Uh, she's in a recurring role in Everyone Else Burns for Channel 4. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, we've looked at the passions there. We're pretty much going on time, and I'm going to ask Kate, first of all, I'm going to chink the glass after 15 minutes, um, and after then, well, with one minute to go, uh, you have uh, your time now beginning. Kate, advocate for Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, and thank you to all of you for coming here, partly to hear me talk about Elizabeth I, because as I suggested when we talked about falling in love with these idols, 
I have been babbling away to anyone who will listen from about the age of eight about how wonderful Elizabeth I is, but most of those people were not actually present and listening voluntarily. So having people actually want to hear me go on about her is extraordinary. Um, but as I said, I'm excited to be here most of all because we're really here to listen to, to this extraordinary woman's words and of course the words of an awful, also, that was a slip, also, also amazing Queen Victoria. As I said, Elizabeth really was a wordsmith. She was proficient in six languages. She also, towards the end of her life, undertook a number of translations from Greek and Latin, also from Italian. She undertook personal scholarship. But language was at the heart of everything she did, and it was a hugely important tool in the very difficult job of asserting herself as a female monarch in a world that still wasn't used to that kind of feminine authority. And I couldn't really ask for anyone better than Greta to be here and to be Elizabeth's voice for us. But mad as I am to try and even compete with Greta, I'm actually going to start by quoting from a poem myself. And the reason I'm quoting from this and not Greta is that it's not a poem written by Elizabeth. This isn't her voice. It's a poem written about her. And it was written shortly after 1597 at what should have been the height of her power. So the Spanish Armada had been defeated, the various attempts by Philip of Spain to send a repeat invasion, they'd all been rebuffed, all of the little sequels. Um, Elizabeth had won a big standoff with her bishops, the, the time of those terrible, threatening assassination plots by both radical Puritans and Catholics, they were all in the rear mirror. Things seemed to be, she seems to be doing pretty well at this point. But nonetheless, this is a poem written by an anonymous courtier in a commonplace book, which, is really, which was passed around the court anonymously and is really the sort of Elizabethan equivalent of um, naughty notes passed around the back of a classroom about the teacher. She that was thought so full with wisdom fraught that all the world might go to her to school, and he that at no time by her was taught is taken yet by some but half a fool. She that taught princes how their states to wield, and that ambassadors what to do and say. She that for sober and devout was held, and clerks and priests taught how to preach and pray. She that so many years refused to wed, and boasted what virginity was worth. Even she, I say, hath lost her maidenhead, and daughters three, to all the world brought forth, which all of her on church and on church steeple are bastards, bred right children of the people. You see, the key thing about Elizabeth I is she never had it easy. Here she is, a woman being praised for running the most intellectual of courts, advising the younger princes of Europe, which she did. She became a sort of older statesman in her letters, and you can read her being begged for advice by, by newcomer princes. She's even you know, uh, keeping theologically on top of the clergy. But whenever there is a woman projecting a public face, there will be a man jumping up at the back to say that whatever her claims to intellect, to virginity, really, she must be a dissembling whore. Now, I'm not starting with this to suggest that Elizabeth I was any kind of victim, nor that she was alone in facing misogyny, and I'm sure we'll be hearing Victoria definitely did. But her position in the 16th century was exceptional. She was living through a time when female rule was still very, very new, very, very threatening, and... Um, she, as I think many of you will know, she faced <coughs> barriers that were political, dynastic, and yes, deeply cultural. And I think because we are so used to the idea of Elizabeth as gloriously successful, and you know, many of you have already voted for her as the, as, as the winner of this debate, which obviously you should still do, please don't switch. We're so used to the idea of her in control that we sometimes forget how much opposition she continued to face. And in particular, this kind of misogyny, of which I could have you know, selected thousands of examples, really was the background noise that continued throughout her reign. She was constantly, from the beginning of her reign to the end, having to just sort of battle against this in the background. And yet, of course, she did. And despite everything, she succeeded. She was the longest serving Tudor monarch, as you will know. She oversaw huge economic expansion. She provided the political stability that allowed for the great flourishing of the arts. 
And one of the things that I admire most about her and that I feel speaks deeply to our time is that she brokered compromise in an era of extraordinary political polarization. I think that's something we really could learn an awful lot from at the moment. She comes to the throne when the center of government has swung from this sort of hardline Protestant um, revolution spearheaded by the men who are controlling the boy king, Edward VI. And of course, it then swings back to the Catholic retrenchment of Mary Tudor. And really, when Elizabeth shows up as queen, age 25, it's almost amazing that there isn't a religious civil war. But instead, at the age of 25, she starts, her first job is to start brokering that political compromise, which is the Church of England. And whose legacy, I think, is not just for those of us who have any religious faith or any relationship with the Church of England privately, but it is the model for every compromise that ever happens in British politics afterwards. It is what establishes the idea not just of religious toleration, but political toleration. And what is extraordinary about it is that she asserts that she is, she is going to allow religious toleration until and unless your religious disagreements with her lead you to actually start committing open treason. As she wrote to the uh, Earl of Sussex in 1567, Our laws do not make search of man's conscience without occasion manifestly given by outward deeds committed against the laws. What she's talking about here is thought crime. It is radical in the 16th century to come to the throne and say you're not interested in prosecuting thought crime. And that alone is an extraordinary political moment. But although I could talk for the whole of the rest of the speech about her politics and her political achievements, I suspect a lot of you already know about them. And I think many of us already understand that Elizabeth was an extraordinarily dynamic leader. She, she had huge political achievements, you know, balanced the demands of parliament and the people and the clergy. We know that. What does worry me is that I think in that myth of the dynamic, assertive Elizabeth, we sometimes see her also as a bit of an ice queen. There is an idea that she must be a bit frightening, you know, that she, to be a woman who is so completely in control, you've got to be something of an ice queen. And that is something of a myth that I want to take you behind in the rest of the speech. When you look at her letters, when you look at her poems, you find a deep humanity in a woman who was vulnerable, constantly aware of her own politically, political insecurity, constantly trying to avoid extreme and violent actions, as when, of course, she spent years and years and years prevaricating over whether or not to execute Mary, Queen of Scots, because she wasn't naturally drawn to the assertion of a violent state. And she was also actually someone who could be a very good friend. I don't have time to go into it all now, but if you, we've had some wonderful recent books by people like Anna Whitlock and Tracy Borman, which I really recommend to you which really take apart the myth that Elizabeth wasn't friends with other women. They look at her relationships with women of the bedchamber. They look at her beautiful condolence letters that she, that she wrote when her female friends lost people close to them. And there is a humanity in a woman there who was at the center actually of a small, sometimes quite secretive female power network in her own bedchamber that we need to think about more as we're so used to this idea of her as this great political character facing off with men. But um, yes, she was someone who for much of her reign was very scared, who was very much alone, who was very insecure. But of course, that didn't stop her. So let's start with what we all know. She was never expected to sit on the throne, and yet she did for 45 years. She was a survivor. She was the daughter of a woman executed for adultery at the age of three. Uh, she was declared a bastard and rejected by her father. At 14, she was investigated as an accomplice to treason. In fact, uh, the person who was executed for treason was not someone who, with whom she was a willing accomplice, but someone who had sexually abused her, and she was blamed for it, as women are. Um, she, uh, at the age of 20, both she and her sister Mary had to escape capture by the armed rebels who were behind the uprising that sought to put Lady Jane Grey on the throne after the death of their brother, Edward VI. And at 23, with Mary, her sister, on the throne, she found herself accused of high treason again. She found her sister had been convinced that she was complicit in a plot led by Sir Thomas Wyatt. And not only was she taken to the tower, but one night she actually had to convince the constable of the tower not to execute a death warrant that had been written out by her. 
Now, Mary and Elizabeth are often um, thought to have always been enemies, but that isn't really the case. They were very close for much of her childhood. Uh, they lived together many t for, for long periods, and there were some wonderfully affectionate letters between them before politics drove them apart. One of my favourites is where Elizabeth writes to Mary, emphasising about period pain. She could really be a sort of woman's woman at, time, at times. But this, of course, was the worst moment. She'd been arrested. Um, she'd been arrested in her private rooms by uh, guards who were determined to take her to the Tower of London. So she, but she sits down, because she's Elizabeth and she's this kind of woman, she just refuses to go. So uh, she demands the right to write to her sister Mary before she leaves, and she takes so long doing it in her bedroom that by the time she's finished, the tide has turned, and, uh, and the guards are simply just not able to take her to the Tower of London because the river won't let them go by boat. And this is why the letter you're about to hear, which she writes to her sister, is often called the Tide Letter. If any ever did try this old saying, that a king's word was more than another man's oath, I most humbly beseech your majesty to verify it in me and to remember your last promise and my last demand that I be not condemned without answer and due proof, which it seems that I now am, for that without cause proved, I am by your counsel from, your, from you commanded to go unto the tower, a place more wanted for a false traitor than a true subject. So this is Elizabeth at her toughest. She knows the law, she knows the importance of proof, and she also knows the PR disaster that will happen if she is seen being taken to the tower, because of course, very few people who go into the tower ever come out, and most people assume it's over for them the moment they're on a boat on the Thames. I've also included this speech because it includes um, a phrase that Elizabeth will come to use again and again in her own time as queen, which is this focus on the idea that the word of a prince, not even something sworn, but a word that's just thrown away casually, is more binding than the oath of a common man. Because, as I say, Elizabeth was someone who put huge value on the word of a queen, of, on the word of any monarch. Um, and she chose her own words very carefully. But what's really moving about this letter to me comes in the next paragraph. She appeals to Mary as a sister. And in doing so, she takes a huge risk. I've mentioned before that she was caught up in a scandal when Thomas Seymour was executed and that many people believe them to have had a sexual relationship. They may even indeed have done so. Um, but were not sympathetic to the fact that she was 14 and that he was her 40-year-old guardian, which most of us would call grooming nowadays. But it was a huge scandal at the time, and Elizabeth didn't refer to it lightly. But she does here. She refers to the Admiral, as Seymour was known, and she refers to the fact that he'd been executed on the orders of his brother, the Duke of Somerset. And so she touches on this really painful part in her life, not because she's proud of it, but because it is a reminder to Mary of the tragedy that happens when siblings turn against each other. And she knows also that Mary will understand how difficult it is for her to retell this story. For all the turmoil in Tudor politics, for Elizabeth, families are still sacred. I have heard in my time of many cast away for want of coming to the presence of their prince, and in late days, I heard my Lord of Somerset say that if his brother had been suffered to speak with him, he would have never suffered. But the persuasions were made to him so great that he thought to believe that he could not live safely if the Admiral lived, and that made him give his consent to his death. Though these persons are not to be compared to your majesty, yet... I pray God that evil persuasions persuade not one sister against the other, and all for that they have heard false report and not hearkened to the truth known. Therefore, once again, kneeling with humbleness of my heart, because I am not suffered to bow the knees of my body, I humbly crave to speak with your highness. 
And of course, she does survive. And she goes on to be um, not just the longest lasting of the Tudor monarchs, but one of the most popular monarchs. She famously um, you know, based her, her claim to authority on traveling around the country, having real, long before Victoria and her successors invented the royal walkabout, she spent months and months of her time on progresses and famously, of course, um, she used this to justify her decisions. Uh, this is the key line that many of you will know from her famous golden speech in 1601. And though God hath raised me high, yet this I count the glory of my crown, that I have reigned with your loves. And she constantly... Um, draws attention to her relationship with the people as the thing in which she's really uh, uses to justify, to prove her diligence, to prove how diligent she is in caring about the safety of her people. Of course, she can, of course, she can be pretty tough when she needs to be. Um, in 1566, a group of law, members of the House of Lords and the House of Commons show up um, at Whitehall and deliver a petition uh, begging her to marry and to name a successor, which is, of course, the last thing she wants to do. And she is absolutely furious at the idea of Parliament uh, telling her what to do. And although I've included a few excerpts, I think we're just going to use the first one for time. Yeah, this is how she reacts when someone tells her she might not know what's best for the country. Was I not born in the realm? Were my parents born in a foreign country? Is there any cause I should alienate myself from being careful over this country? <clears throat> Is not my kingdom here? Whom have I oppressed? Whom have I enriched to others' harm? What turmoil have I made in this commonwealth that I should be, that I should be suspected to have no regard on the same? How have I governed since my reign? I will be tried by envy itself. I need not to use many words, for my deeds do try me. Okay. Thank you. And I'm actually going to ask you to read the second excerpt, just because the other thing that's remarkable about this speech um, is that it's a reminder of the ways in which Elizabeth was always marked by the early insecurities of her reign. You will remember from the tide letter, how much, um, how close to danger she stood in her sister's reign. This is how it defined her politics afterwards. I am sure there was not one of them that ever was a second person, as I have been, and have tasted of the practices against my sister, who I would to God were alive again. I stood in danger of my life. My sister was so incensed against me. I differ from her in religion, and I was sought for in diverse ways, and so shall never my successor be. And of course, what she's talking about there is why she's so determined not to name an heir. She's been an heir to the throne. She knows that those people are constantly surrounded by plots, constantly the focus of people wanting to get rid of the old queen and put on the new one. She is determined that's never going to happen in her lifetime. But she does remain deeply, deeply insecure. And of course, the biggest uh, source of in that insecurity is Mary, Queen of Scots, who flees to England in 1568 who is the heir to the throne, but is also a Catholic, which means she has lots of Catholic friends who want to put her on the throne instead of Elizabeth. And one of the things that I find really interesting about Elizabeth is she's very tough in public when confronting threats like this, and the way she talks about Mary is very tough. But this is a private poem which tells you how sort of threatened and confused she is. It's a poem in which she writes about the need for peace, her determination to be a peaceful monarch. She talks about keeping a rusty sword, i.e. her armour is rusty because she's not using it for war, but if she's really pushed, she's going to dig the old sword out at the end. So the doubt of future foes. The doubt of my future foes exiles my present joy 
and wit me warns me to shun snares as threaten mine annoy. For falsehood now doth flow, and subjects' faith doth ebb, which should not be if reason ruled or wisdom weaved the web. But clouds of joys untried do cloak aspiring minds, which turn to rain of late repent by changed course of winds. The top of hope supposed the root upreared shall be, and fruitless all their great grafted guile, as shortly ye shall see. The dazzled eyes with pride, which great ambition blinds, shall be unsealed by worthy whites, whose foresight falsehood finds. The daughter of debate, that discord I doth sow, shall reap no gain where former rule still peace hath taught to know. No foreign banished white shall anchor in this port. Our realm brooks not seditious sects. Let them elsewhere resort. My rusty sword through rest shall first his edge employ to pull their tops that seek such change or gape for future joy. So this is my Elizabeth. She is an extraordinary survivor. She spends most of her life deeply insecure and of course completely on her own. Unlike Victoria, she never finds a partner to support her through the process of ruling. She, um, she is absolutely terrifying if you are a parliamentarian getting in her way. Um, but if you are a friend, if you are a woman of her bedchamber, she is the best ally you could possibly have. Most importantly of all, though, she is the advocate of religious toleration in this country. And of course, she is the woman who rises to the occasion when England most needs someone to rally it. So I'm going to end, and I will sit down and say no more, but I am going to ask Greta to read what I think you all were here to here for, really, which is the key paragraph of that famous Tilbury speech. I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king, and a king of England, too. And think foul scorn that Parma or Spain or any prince of Europe should dare to invade the borders of my realm, to which, rather than any dishonor shall grow by me, I myself will take up arms. I myself will be your general, judge, and rewarder of every one of your virtues in the field. So, uh, thank you very much, Greta. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, we have now had the advocacy uh, for uh, Elizabeth I. We're now going to shoot through the 17th century, shoot through the 18th century. I mean, after all, nothing happened in those uh, years until suddenly, <laughs> then 1837, uh, history takes off again, life takes off again. We wake up uh, with Daisy and uh, Kate. And, uh, and off we go. Oh, thanks, Anthony. Um, yeah, I enjoyed waking up with this lovely audience. Um, and thank you very much, Kate and Greta. That was a fantastic advocacy for Queen Elizabeth, who, of course, was an extraordinary woman. And to be honest, to compare Elizabeth and Victoria is a bit like going into a zoo and saying, oh, which do I like best, the tigers? Or the water buffalo. Um, <laughs> you know, they're both animals bred in captivity and sort of very much unlike any, anybody else. Um, but I'm going to make the, you know, I'm going to try and persuade you that, especially the women in the audience, um, and maybe even some of the men, that if you are going to vote in this slightly odd way, then you might think about voting for Victoria because 
she may not have been as exceptional as Elizabeth. And, you know, she didn't speak six languages. She only spoke four, I think. Um, and she didn't write poems, but she did write a diary every day and I think did 62 million words in the course of her 63-year reign. Um, and the thing about Victoria is that she was an exceptional person. She was rather an ordinary person, but she was an ordinary person who um, came through exceptionally well. And I think she's... It depends what you want a queen to be for. If you want a queen to be a remote and extraordinary figure, that's one thing. If you want a queen to be someone you can think, well, she's doing the best job in the circumstances that she's a human being, she's a template for the way that we all would like to live, then maybe you should consider Victoria. Um, I've spoken before about my personal introduction to, to Victoria and how I found this saucy entry in her diaries. And um, it was one of those moments where, you know, it was a very quiet university library. And when I read that thing about the tight white cashmere pantaloons and nothing under them, I gave a sort of shriek of, of adolescent laughter and everybody looked around. And at that point, I thought, here was Victoria, that I could find in Victoria something that I could really get to grips with. And then 40 years later, when I was, came to write the series about her, I just had this sort of vision in my head of, um, as a mother myself, I, I also have a, a very small teenage daughter, what well, I did at the time, who was five foot, very bolshy, couldn't stand me, because I kept saying, you know, things like homework and bed and all that kind of stuff. And I just sort of thought, God, what would it be like if this very bolshy, small person woke up one morning and found that she was the most powerful woman in the world, which is what, exactly what happened to Victoria. She was 18 years old, and one day she wakes up and she's the queen, you know. And, you know, imagine what it would be like for her, but also imagine what it would be like for her mother. Anyway, we'll, we'll put that aside. So I have this sort of soft spot for Victoria because she was not very well educated. She grew up in this weird system called the Kensington system, which was basically a plot on the part of her mother and her mother's kind of lover slash private secretary, um, Sir John Conroy, to keep her under their thumb until Victoria became queen, um, and then they could rule through her. But Victoria was rather kind of, she wasn't having that. She was an only child. Her father had died when she was eight months old. And when she was 15, she was very ill in Ramsgate, and she had typhus, and they came in, and it's just like a Victorian novel, and I suppose it's a scene from a Victorian novel recounted by Victoria, so she probably, you know, was, was in her own way an author of her times, and she said that they came in, and they tried to force her to sign this paper, giving them all the power, you know, giving her pa them, private, uh, Sir John Conroy, the power of being the private secretary, which we know is a very powerful job, and she refused to sign it, even though she was practically at death's door. And that just showed that she was not going to take any, any of this stuff from Conroy and her mother. So she was a pretty de determined young woman, even at the age of 15. So when she came to the throne at 18, um, she was, you know, even though she had this resistance against the people who'd sort of keeping her captive under house arrest, as it were, she, you know, when she comes to the throne at 18, this is the thing I love about her, the Archbishop of Canterbury's just come in and said, you're the queen, ma'am, and they've all kneeled towards her, and, you know, I had this, I had this vision um, when I was making the programme that Victoria was this little person looking up at this kind of row of white heads, like a sort of child in a forest, and, you know, there are always people saying, you know, ma'am, whatever. And then she sends everybody away, and she says, and she writes in her diary, I spent an hour quite alone. It was so delightful. And do you know, that was the first time in her entire life up till then that she had ever been alone. And that was extraordinary. And that was for her was the greatest luxury of all. But then she meets the man who is the first man she's ever been alone with, and that was the gloriously charming, affable, urbane um, Lord Melbourne, who was her first Prime Minister. And Lord Melbourne, you know, she's 18, he's 60. Um, in my series, he was played by Rufus Sewell, so you can imagine. Um, and he was incredibly charming, and he just, you know, adored this girl, because he was a sort of, well, I don't think, his interest in her was was paternal. Um, it wasn't 
it wasn't in any way abusive. He, he actually saw that he had a sort of duty to kind of teach her some stuff because she knew nothing. I mean, she really had no sort of grounding in statecraft. She hadn't learned Latin. She, she was good at the piano. She did a mean watercolour. Um, you know, she spoke French. She could dance. She could do all the sort of girly skills. But what she didn't have was, you know, she'd never read the Constitution. She'd never waded her way through black stones. She was a kind of, she was a bit of a sort of, you know, not an ignoramus, but she hadn't been given the tools that she needed because the, her mother and Conroy had deliberately sort of excluded her from that knowledge. So Lord M gave her a sort of crash course in how to be a queen. And of course, they spent a lot of time together and he was very charming and she was very impressionable and she'd never spent much time with a charming man before. And so she developed this huge crush on him. And what's so charming about her diaries is that from the time when she becomes queen and the time um, and the three years until she gets married, these diaries are clearly totally uncensored. They are the very candid recollections of a teenager, you know, in the throes of first love. And I absolutely love them because you know that afterwards, before she marries, uh, be before she comes to the, the throne, you know that her mother is reading her diaries and, and, and sort of, so she's writing them for her mother. After she gets married, it's pretty clear that I think Albert is reading her diaries. And then, so she's writing them slightly for Albert's eye. <laughs> and after that, um, you know, well, after Albert dies, which after all was, you know, they're only married for 20 years and she was on the throne for 63. It's, it's a different matter. But in those three years between becoming queen and marrying Albert, she writes completely uncensored, and they are glorious. So I'm just going to get Kate to read you just a selection of her little sort of um, musings on her relationship with the man that she always calls Lord M. 1st of July, 1837. Talked with Lord M about many important things. He is indeed a truly honest, straightforward and noble-minded man. A man in whom I can safely place confidence. There are not many like him in this world of deceit. Saturday, 19th May, 1838. I said I often stood before a person not knowing what to say. And Lord M said the longer one thought about it, the worse it was. <laughs> and really, the best thing was to say anything foolish rather than to say nothing. Friday, 17th of August. I said to Lord M, I was afraid he disliked the Germans as he was always laughing at them. <laughs> he said, I have a great opinion of their talents, but not of their beauty. <laughs> Tuesday, 28th of August. Lord M said it was a difficult subject, the marriage of a monarch. Marrying a subject was inconvenient, and there was inconvenience in foreigners. Anyway, I mean, I, 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 I really enjoyed her relationship with Lord Ed. But, of course, Victoria was not as scared, unlike some people we know, was not scared of getting married. I mean, you know, with good reason. Um, and she decided she was going to get married, and she married her first cousin, Prince Albert. Uh, it was lucky for her. It, it's quite an interesting sort of role reversal from the usual sort of Victorian novel where it's the heroine waiting, is the man going to propose, da 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 in this case, Albert was sent over from Germany on approval. And the last time she'd met him, she thought, nah, not so sure. He goes to bed really early and he doesn't like dancing. He's a bit of a bore. Anyway, and so she wasn't sure whether she wanted to marry him. And he didn't really want to come over, you know, to be inspected and then to have her send him back because then what was he going to do? You know, he'd be the youngest son. Anyway, so he comes over and it's clear pretty much from the first moment she takes one look at him and goes, mm, you know, tight white cashmere pantaloons and so forth. And he has learnt to dance. So they, they kind of, you know, they have this whirlwind romance and literally whirlwind romance because he's there for three days and on the third day she proposes. And funnily enough, he says yes. And they get married um, a few weeks, six weeks later and she is pregnant, much to her disgust, um, you know, within about 10 minutes of their getting married. <laughs> um, 
there has been. I've, I've looked at these dates quite closely, and I've often wondered whether there might have been a little bit of hanky-panky before the wedding, but, you know, obviously, you know, as if, as if. But it was certainly a very, very, to begin with, well, it was a very lusty marriage. They both enjoyed it extremely much. When you think of Victoria, you know, people do think of a sort of, of, she has a rather prudish image. There was nothing prudish about Victoria at all. Nothing she liked better than, you know, she loved what she called fun in bed. And um, nothing she liked better than a really good gynecological conversation with her, with anyone really, her children, her ladies in waitings about all kinds of things which we, we won't talk about here. Anyway, I'm just going to give you a little sample of how she felt about getting married to Albert um, from Kate here. He's going to read an excerpt. We had dinner in our sitting room, but I had such a sick headache that I could eat nothing and was obliged to lie down in the middle blue room for the remainder of the evening, on the sofa. But, ill or not, I never, never spent such an evening. My dearest, dear Albert sat on a footstool by my side, and his excessive love and affection gave me feelings of heavenly love and happiness I never could have hoped to have felt before. He clasped me in his arms, and we kissed each other again and again. Oh, this was the happiest day of my life. So, um, as you know, Victoria had nine children. And, um, you know, as a working mother, I have to say, I take my hat off to her, because to have, you know, I only had two children, but to have nine children and to be head of state, I think, takes quite a lot of great determination and an enormous amount of help, which of course she had, you know, she had hot and cold running maidservants or whatever, but she took a ve she had a very close eye on her children and on the country. Um, she was, of course, ably assisted by Albert, who was probably the brightest member of the royal family there has ever been. Um, I don't think he was much fun, but he was, I mean, out of bed, I, I don't know, but he was, he was, he was, he was, an amazing, you know, he was really a visionary. And, um, you know, if only got to walk around South Kensington to see what he and Victoria did, you know, all those museums, all of that was all funded by the product of the Great Exhibition, 1852. So they were, you know, a terrific power couple. But I think you've got to give credit to Victoria for managing, for managing Albert and the children and the country. And anybody who is married has a job is married to a man with a job and has children knows that that can be quite a difficult negotiation and one that she managed to to pull off and I have to say I, I personally have a great deal of respect for her for that but there's no doubt that she could be infuriating at times and I think you know there are there are great stories of her you know running after Albert through the corridors of Windsor Castle saying, please stop and listen to me, you know, and him going, oh, God, but you've said it all so many times before, you know. And I, I, I rather love this. I love the way that she's, she's like a sort of tempest, you know. She's either going to kind of, you know, she, she's like the weather and everybody's like, oh, what's it going to be like today? But, but I think that's one of the reasons that, you know, she gets rather a bad press, mainly from male historians, you know, male historians like Elizabeth, because Elizabeth, Elizabeth I, because Elizabeth I is a reasonable person who does logical things. And, you know, she, I don't, well, she's kind of, you know, she's a king in all but name. Isn't she? She's like Margaret Thatcher. She's power dressed. She's got the whole, the, the caboodle and whatever. And she's, you know, she's got the heart and stomach of a king. She's basically... A, 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 a king in drag. Victoria is never anything other than a woman. She is a woman, she's infuriating, she's a nightmare, she can be a nightmare, men can be a nightmare too, but the point is that she doesn't pretend to be anything else. And that's one of the reasons I think women should kind of look upon her fondly because, you know, why do you have to be powerful like a man? Why can't you be powerful like a woman? And I think that's what Victoria does rather brilliantly. Um, so, for example, you know, her foreign policy, I mean, she wasn't able to kind of send, um, you know, armies out into the field or do any of that sort of stuff, because that's not what queens did in the 19th century. But um, what she could do was to conduct her own foreign policy through her family. And she and Albert had this genius scheme that they were going to have, all, you know, they had all these children, they were going to marry them off into the royal heads of Europe. 
and um, you know, create their own European Union with <laughs> Victoria at the centre, with England at the centre. Um, and so, which is in fact what they did. And so she had this extraordinary sort of um, uh, unofficial network of relationships with all the kings and queens of Europe and knew very well what was going on. And, you know, she warned ages before it became clear that, you know, Wilhelm the Kaiser was going to be a, a right problem later on. And she knew this because at the wedding of the Prince of Wales, he rushes up and bites his uncle in the in the in the calf, you know, wearing his kilt, he rushes up and, and bites him. So she she knew from then on that, you know, the Kaiser was going to be trouble, and um, and she's extremely cross with the the Russians. She she regards the Russians as absolutely the most nouveau riche royals in the world, and she thinks that that and she warns her granddaughter. Alex, not to marry Nicholas II, because she says, you'll be blown up, my dear. You'll be, you'll be killed by terrorists. It's like, well, yes. Hmm. Anyway, so she, she had a pretty good idea of what was going on. Um, and she felt it, she had very passionate views, most of which were not acted on by her prime ministers. But here is a flavour of them in a letter she wrote to Disraeli in 1867. Oh, if the Queen were a man, she told Israeli, she would like to go and give those horrid Russians, whose word one cannot trust, such a beating. When her secretary remonstrated about her writing directly to the Tsar, she said, it is a miserable thing to be a constitutional Queen and to be unable to do what is right. The other thing about... Um Victoria is that she was very much at one with her people. I mean, you know, she, unlike, unlike Elizabeth, you know, who's, who, who put on, as she got older and older and older, put on more and more and more makeup, um, you know, covered her face in white lead, put on wigs, all this kind of thing. Victoria was not at all worried about growing old in public. She was the first monarch ever to be photographed, and she... Um, Instead of being photographed in sort of full robes and a crown and the whole kit and caboodle, she was photographed wearing, you know, what any other woman in the country would have been wearing at the time, um, a crinoline, a shawl and a bonnet. And this was, I think, shows her sort of her pleasure in being an ordinary woman. You know, yes, she was a queen, but she was also just like you and just like her subjects. You know, you could see this picture of her, you know, a photograph in her bonnet in every kind of photographer's shop window in the country. So she had a real connection because not only could they, could they see her as she kind of went around London or went to Balmoral or went to one of her many, uh, many residences, but they could actually see a photograph. In fact, you could take a photograph of her home and many people had photographs of, of the Queen and her, and her children in their homes. And I think she established a real connection with her people because they, they sense rightly that she had many of the same preoccupations as they did. I mean, I often think that Victoria, if she'd been alive today, would definitely be on Twitter and she'd probably have more followers than Trump. She'd make a pretty good job of editing the Daily Mail. There's a, there's a, a letter I don't have time to read now about uh, her letter to the Home Secretary about, you know, saying, what are you doing about Jack the Ripper? Have you actually searched all those hostels looking for bloody clothing? Have you done that? And the Home Secretary's like, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. You know, so she's got absolutely a sense of what Middle England thinks and feels. But I suppose the thing I really want to sort of conclude by saying is that you know, Victoria, <laughs> Victoria, you know, she wasn't vain. She didn't care about getting older. She wasn't, um, she didn't hark over, over lost glory. She'd gone through this terrible um, bereavement when she was only 42 when Albert died. And that was awful for her, really awful. And then she found, you know, she found love again, first with John Brown, who was her servant, and then with the Munchie. And I think one of the really interesting things about Victoria is that although she was, you know, the empress, she, she really felt that she was the kind of mother of her people. She didn't, feel, she didn't feel superior to them. She felt that she was in a position of trust. And her last great love was, of course, 
her Urdu teacher, the Munshi, and, you know, all the courtiers were absolutely horrified by this relationship, you know, between the queen and this sort of rather dubious Indian. And she's wonderful writing back to them and pointing out why they're snobs and she's right. So we'll just, this is the last extract. Letter from Victoria to members of her household in 1894, complaining about the Munshi's conduct. To make out the poor good Munshi is low is really outrageous and in a country like England, quite out of place. The Queen has known two archbishops who were sons respectively of a butcher and a grocer, a chancellor whose father was a poor sort of Scotch minister, <coughs> Sir David Stuart and Lord Mount Stephen, both who ran about barefoot as children, and the tradesmen Maple and Price were made baronets. Abdul's father saw good and honourable service as a doctor, and he feels cut to the heart at being thus spoken of. The Queen is so sorry for the poor Munshi's sensitive feelings. So, I'd just like to say that when Victoria um, celebrated her Diamond Jubilee, her Prime Minister said to her, Ma'am, we'd really like you to go out in your carriage wearing your crown. And she just said, not happening. I'm going to wear my bonnet because I'm a poor widow woman and that's what my public know that I am. And that was, I thought, very touching. You know, she, Elizabeth was Gloriana. Elizabeth, you know, was an extraordinary creature from another planet almost, but Victoria never, ever forgot that she was an ordinary woman. So you can vote for a, a prodigy, a triumph of artifice, or you can vote for a woman Ooh. who allowed herself <laughs> to be photographed in a shawl <coughs> and a bonnet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm just going to ask you to read the first verse. For, for bringing out Victoria's inner woman uh, and much else besides, thanks again. Let's, thanks again to Daisy and Kate. Let's have a really big round of applause. <laughs> And uh, decide to win because um, I don't know whether you knew this in advance, but they, you both will, or you both will, have um, your selection of the painting. That's why they're out here uh, to be presented to take home are uh, the one who, who wins. And isn't that marvelous? Now, have your questions ready. Uh, once, uh, we're just going to have a rapid fire uh, set of four questions. Here, um, uh, the first now Sotheby's have very nicely uh, invited both monarchs to dinner here. Um, charming. Um, who is going to speak first, and what are they going to say to each other? Oh, when they meet. Yes. Um, actually, Elizabeth is going to ask Victoria um, how her children are. Um, she's going to offer much sympathy on uh, the latest of all their illnesses, because although. Uh, Daisy may have suggested that Elizabeth was this sort of remote, grand prodigy who didn't have the human touch. Actually, as I've been trying to say, she was someone who was very, very kind and interested in other women. We'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, who, who would speak first and what would she say? <laughs> uh, I think Victoria would. Uh, Victoria might have asked about um, Amy Robsart and uh, Lettuce Knollis, mightn't she? Who she wasn't very, wasn't she rather unkind you to let us know? I, I thought we weren't sorry. doing this as a cat fight at all. <laughs> but if we're going to ask pointed questions about relationships with other women, I think Elizabeth might really ask Victoria if she regrets bullying La Lady Flora Hastings well, just no, before she, she died of cancer. No, she did. Uh, that was a bad thing. She was pregnant. We're, we're going to have the thought, thought police out on that. Uh, were, was your monarch really interested in the arts? And what did she most love? Well, absolutely. I mean, as I've demonstrated, she was a poet herself. And, um, and what does she most love? What one work of art would she take to her desert island? Um, I think she would take to her desert island her own translation of Boethius' Consolation of Philosophy, which is something she translated in her old age. And what's fascinating about it is it's about the experience of being a political prisoner after you've been the top man in court. That's why the, ma the man in question needs consolation. He needs philosophy to keep him sane in a prison cell. And she decides to take this and write this very, very long translation, musing on what it means to have been the queen of court or the king, lost all power, and be facing death, and only have 
philosophy and Christian morality to make you cope. So Boethius, um, and what work of art would Victoria take to her desert island? Ooh, I think it would be a toss-up between Jane Eyre, which she read to Albert three times, um, and um, I think it might be one of those wonderful Landseer paintings. Uh, I like the one where she's sitting on her horse and John Brown is holding the reins and she's, you know, she, she's no, a no, widow. We don't, we don't know, but everyone would love to know. Okay, she's a widow, she's got a black morning thing on um, and, you know, she's, she's, her daughters are sitting over there reading a letter. She's holding, um, she's hold, uh, John Brown is holding the reins and there's just a suspicion that she's saying, it's all right now, I've got John Brown at my side. Um, and can I just say that Victoria did, was the first monarch to publish two best-selling books. Catherine Parr in 1547. No, I'm, not, I'm not saying, I'm not saying, I'm not saying, I'm not saying Elizabeth did I'm just saying, I'm just saying she did, because I... She did, she did, she did. And uh, so did Elizabeth prefer the company of other women or men? <sighs> Oh, it depends on the time. I mean, she obviously was a terrible flirt, particularly with the Earl of Leicester, who she was probably in love with. But the closest person in her life to her for years was probably Catherine Ashley, who was her mother substitute, who was her governess, and who also built this collection of other women around her, mainly young women who were schooled with her, um, and who was the only person who was allowed to tell her off in public when she went down on her knees in court and begged Elizabeth to stop flirting with Leicester and in public. And who was the bigger flirt, your woman or this woman? Well, I think what we've both tried to suggest is that they're actually both terribly sexual beings. So uh, neither of us want our women to be seen as prudes. Okay. Um, does Elizabeth prefer, does Victoria prefer women or men in company? Hmm. I think she likes both, actually. I think she, you know, she loved a charming man. Who doesn't, Anthony? Um, and she loved them. And, you know... But she also had very close relationships with women as well. She was very close to her sister. She was very close to her daughters when they were grown up. Um, she was very close to her ladies in waiting. So became, they became very, very close friends. And, you know, I think, I think both queens had that experience that they were never really alone. They always had women in the background all the time. So the idea that they were sort of queen bees is, it, it could never be true because they were always surrounded by women who they had to get on with. You know, they, that, the, they depended on them uh, to make them look good and to so make the, them feel you know, good. You know, this man on the stage is doing a deplorable job at the moment, timekeeping. So I'm gonna have to insist here uh, that on this final uh, dinner, um, her Madge has invited um, Elizabeth I to dinner at Buckingham Palace. Okay, okay. Uh, what would Elizabeth say to her, your Elizabeth? Well, first off, Elizabeth I would not be wearing um, pancake makeup, as Daisy suggested, because that is a total myth <laughs> perpetrated by male historians who want to accuse her of that. I'm sorry, reality. I'm sorry, but everybody. yes, but yes, <laughs> she would say to her Madge. Gosh, what's it like having no power? That must be really weird. <laughs> That's a bit bitchy, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, she could be, I'm going to be honest. And what would Victoria say to her, to her great-great-granddaughter? Uh, uh, great-great-granddaughter. I think she'd say, why did you name yourself after Elizabeth? <laughs> <laughs> why didn't you give, why didn't, why aren't you Victoria II? Because the thing about Victoria, this is one of the things I love about her, is that she made up her name. There were no Victorias when she was born. And she was called Alexandrina Victoire. And she thought, you know what, I'm going to go. She was a believer, obviously, in nominative self-determinism. And she thought, I'm going to go for a, a winner's name. And that okay. is Victoria. Uh, and, and this could be decisive. <laughs> Any Victorias in the audience? Hands up. Ooh. Whoa. And any Elizabeths in the audience? <laughs> See? Uh, there we are. Uh, that's saying something very significant. <laughs> let's just have time for a quick couple of questions. Hands up, please. Lady here. Uh, let's have the mics over, uh, unless you've got a big voice. I was just going to ask, wasn't Queen Victoria against votes for women? She was against votes for and women. In a room full of women. Well, no, 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 but hang on, women? hang on. But I think the point about Victoria <laughs> is that if she had, um, I, I think it'd be very hard to imagine votes for women without Victoria being on the throne because basically you could see that a woman could have children and still be powerful. So right. I think. Do you see what I mean? Okay. Kind of, and, right, okay. And would Elizabeth have been against votes for women? 
don't know is the answer. <laughs> Let's have the other. Can't make her mind up. Uh, next question. Uh, I'd like to say, first of all, I admire the androgyny of Elizabeth I. You uh, my main point about this was what seems to come between the two of them is romanticism. Therefore, we have Victoria with the concept of marrying for love, which I think would have been unintelligible to Elizabeth I. Fascinating. And was there a, a no question there? That, that, um, I, and by the way, you are definitely, uh, row three on the right-hand side, are definitely the brightest row in the entire <laughs> Southern here. Because there's another question. Sorry, everybody. I don't know why you even bothered to come today. Uh, uh, the gentleman here. During their respective reigns, who do you think empowered and emboldened women of their time? Hey, very good question. What about... Well, first of all, Victoria was against votes for women. I rest my case on that alone. But actually, what is really important about Elizabeth is she gives massive grants of of land and money to other women in a way that is, it's not talked about much, but it is utterly unprecedented. And that is actually how aristocratic women, um, yes, she didn't do much for working class women, but that is how aristocratic could, women increased their political You could say there weren't a lot of other female monarchs before her to have done it, and therefore it was bound to be unprecedented. Yeah, I mean, obviously okay, she's... Right. OK, can I, can I she's say the most... She's a role model. Can I she empowered the political women of the upper classes with money. OK. Um, I, I, I would just say that one thing that Victoria did for all women was that she was the first person to use um, pain relief in childbirth, okay, and she made it okay for women to do that because before that it was considered religiously, you know, it was Eve's curse and whatever, so that's a very big tick. Uh, the second thing was that because, you know, she also supported, um, you know, the, the awful, uh, the, the Married Women's Property Act, so she was somebody, even though she didn't approve of votes for women, she did support Caroline Norton in her incredible, incredible legislative campaign to make sure that women were allowed to keep their property after they got married. So I think, you know, she may not have been a feminist with a capital F, but I think probably if she'd lived another 20 years, she would have supported votes for women. Very good. And, and, and we're just going to have time for the gentleman at the back. I'm so sorry, gentlemen. Do, yes. Doesn't Queen Victoria rather disappear after uh, Albert dies? Well, yeah, so, so what about that shocker, hey? Uh, uh, there she was. She abandoned her... Sorry, I'm supposed to be impartial. Yeah, very good question. Uh, what would you say about her disappearing after Albert died? In well, I think she, she had a period of extended mourning. Yes, she did. But, I mean, you know, he, she'd been married 22 years. He was the father of her nine children. I think she had a bit of a nervous breakdown, and she took some time out. However, she still did all her boxes. She still, you know, was involved in foreign policy. So although she retreated, the public didn't see her as much. She was very much on the job, and by 1869, she came back um, after the Prince of Wales was very ill, and they, and they did a celebratory uh, carriage ride through um, London, and they had huge crowds, and she said, it's almost worth, you know, the trouble to realise how much one is loved. And so, you know, yes, she did have a sort of black spot, but she was on the stage, stage the throne, for 63 years, and it was, you know, she, she went through terrible mourning. And she was only 42, you know, so it's a, a tough break for anyone to have to do that in public. Definitely won over that, that vote there. I'm so, well, uh, in, Jake, can you make it as a statement? I'll make a statement, I'll make a statement, very quick statement. One thing they've both got in common now, and I'd be interested in their reactions, is that they both have underground lines with their name on it. <laughs> <laughs> Can you give me a quick reaction that they, what they would okay, say? Okay, and you... Fantastic question. Big round of applause for that question there. Great question, and you can also take away one of the paintings in this, in this room also for that, and you can take that, Kate, uh, and you can take that in your 60 seconds, and this time I'm going to be much better keeping punctuality, and go. Okay. Sum up. Summing up. Uh, the lady over here mentioned that Victoria married for love, Elizabeth didn't. Now, of course, Elizabeth would have loved to marry for love. As most of us know, she was almost certainly in love with Robert Dudley, but she didn't because she knew that marrying him would plunge her country into civil war. And throughout this 
um, this event, Daisy has tried to suggest that Elizabeth was somehow, you know, less understandable than Victoria. She wasn't someone for whom we can have a real understanding of human suffering. But in fact, she was passionate. She was just very good at ensuring that she put her country over those passionate emotions. And so I'm going to cede all the rest of my time to Greta, who is going to read just the first verse, or Anthony will shout at us, of one last do... poem. Yeah, okay, you're right. yeah, um, you're one start. last poem. Um, which is, was officially written at the end of a French so courtship good. falling apart, but I think is really written about Robert Dudley. And this is Elizabeth, the human being. I grieve and dare not show my discontent. I love and yet am forced to seem to hate. I do, yet dare not say I ever meant. I seem stark mute. But inwardly, I do prate. I am not, I am, and not. I freeze, and yet I'm burned. Since from myself, another self, I turned. My care is like my shadow in the sun. Follows me, flying, flies when I pursue it. Stands, and lies beside me. Doth what I have done. His too familiar care doth make me rue it. No means I find to rid him from my breast, till by the end of things it be suppressed. Some gentler passion slide into my mind, for I am soft and made of melting snow. Or be more cruel, love, and so be kind, let me float or sink, be high or low, or let me live with some more sweet intent, or die and so forget what love e'er meant. <sighs> that was so moving. It was so moving. I'm going to dock you 10% because you overshot the time. Daisy Goodwin. Ah! Oh, I'll, be, uh, I'll be very quick. That was amazing. Um, uh, you know, all, all Victoria did for, for Albert was to build him the Albert Memorial. Um, <laughs> so, what can I say? Um, one, of my, one of my favourite stories about Victoria is that when she goes to stay with um, Napoleon III and Eugenie, Eugenie the, the Empress of France, and Eugenie the Empress of France is, you know, fabulously beautiful, the most beautiful um, woman in the whole world. You know, she's gorgeous, painted by Winterhalter, whatever. And there's Elizabeth. And Elizabeth turns up carrying a rather peculiar bag, and it's got a sort of embroidered dog on the front. And the French are like, qu'est-ce que c'est? Oh, alors, you know, what is this bizarre thing that this dumpy English queen is, is wearing? And it was a bag. Um, embroidered with a picture of her pet poodle by her daughter. And she took that with her on a state visit to France. And, you know, everyone talks about Victoria being a bad mother. No one ever talks about Henry VIII being a bad father, do they? But everyone talks about Victoria being a bad mother. But I, I thought that was a very touching um, issue, uh, example of what she's like. And then when she and Eugenie go to the royal box and, and, and they play the national anthems, um, you know, and they're standing up for the national anthems. And when they sit down, Eugenie looks behind her to see if there's a chair there. But Victoria just sits, because she knows there's going to be a chair behind her, because she's the queen. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> So now it's voting time, and I don't need to remind you how to uh, vote. And, but while you're doing that, just so that we can save time, I'm just going to read out um, the all-important bit at the end. Congratulations to our wonderful actresses. <laughs> and our remarkable advocates. Oh, yeah. And uh, thank you to Intelligence Squared, Hannah Kay and her remarkable team. Oh. And to Sotheby's. And just to remind you, 
that there are two more debates in the Sotheby's Jubilee Arts Festival. The family-friendly, I think that those words were perhaps not necessary, the family-friendly Winnie the Pooh versus Paddington Bear <laughs> next Saturday here at 3 p.m. Um, so that's for the intellectuals. Um, the rest came today. Um, and then we have the Thursday, 9th of June at 7 p.m., Hip Hop versus Shakespeare with George the Poet and Howard Jacobson. <laughs> There's lots going on. I'm just telling you, with Sotheby's website, do look at that. Don't miss the stunning exhibition uh, here another time of the royal and aristocratic tiaras. Uh, and I'm sure they wouldn't mind if you took uh, those home, provided you return them next year when you come back for the debate. <laughs> um, now, let's... Um, very generous, Sotheby's. Big round of applause for Sotheby's general. Now, uh, this really is um, interesting. I mean, I've never known something like this happen. <laughs> um, Elizabeth has, was 49, sorry, was 53%, is now 49%. <laughs> Can we hear that again, please? Uh, was 49%. And Victoria was 29% and is now 46%. Undecided <laughs> 5%. <laughs> but I'm going to dock you 3%, and oh! therefore it's a dead draw. Let's have a big round of applause. <laughs> it was great fun. Thank you.